Welcome back to the Metric Stack Podcast and to Season 3, where we're speaking with thought leaders about the emerging metrics layer. From San Francisco, today I am joined by Brian Kotler, Vice President of Marketing at HighTouch, one of the fastest growing reverse ETL or data sync companies. Brian has an impressive history from Sprinkler and Intercom to New Relic and now, of course, High Touch. My name is Alan Villa, your host and co-founder and CEO at Clifolio. Brian, a big welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me, Alan. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here and, and, and chat with you today. Awesome. That sounds great. So listen, let's let's start with opening questions. So like tell tell the audience a little bit who you are. Uh you've got a you've got an awesome background. And then make sure to touch on like reverse ETL. Like what the heck is reverse ETL? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, so you know, not I, I always get a little uncomfortable talking about myself, so I'll try and keep it brief. But basically, I've spent now coming up on my second decade here helping B two B tech businesses grow um, in, in a whole host of roles and things like that. I've had the pleasure, as you as you mentioned, to help grow a company that was able to IPO in the social media technology space, Sprinkler. Uh, helped uh, Intercom, that famous for the little chat bubble in the bottom corner of many of our websites, uh, that uh, to grow as well. And then I, I transitioned from there over to New Relic, um, where it was part of a really interesting uh, kind of a turnaround story, a company that had, its growth had slowed and kind of turned around. And that was really interesting for me because it was my first time formally leading analytics teams. I always partnered with analytics teams. And for somebody who, you know, full disclosure, doesn't know SQL, to go lead a publicly traded enterprise analytics team is a pretty wild thing. So learned a huge amount there and had a great time doing that. You know what I remember from New Relic is like, so we were a New Relic customer and we might still be today. They sent out t-shirts, like a million t-shirts. Everybody and their neighbor who used New Relic seemed to have a t-shirt. Like that was part of their big marketing play. I think so. I think we uh, the, we wanted everyone to feel that like everyone... It, it's very powerful when you think everyone is using the thing, whether they are or not. It's hard to say, but they're only people, right? Uh, spoken and, like spoken like a true marketer. Yeah, you know that's that's my it's my stock and trade. Um, and so yeah, after working there for a while and helping turn around New Relic uh, and get ourselves growing again and and a really fun stint there, I was sort of inspired and taken by this idea of reverse ETL and, and high touch. Um, and the reason is. Uh, is uh, to, to answer the second part of your question is that reverse ETL actually solves a problem that has plagued me for literally the entirety of my career. And I say that literally my first, 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 first internship um, working at Staples as a teenager, um, nice. we were working on customer 360 initiatives and single source of truth type stuff in like traditional on-prem data warehouses um, and struggling with customer identity and how to activate it. All the way to like, you know, almost 25 years later, you know, uh, working at New Relic. And what reverse ETL really is about is, you know, we pour as a labor of love as analytics teams and operations teams, all this effort into gathering data and processing data to understand our business, understand our customers. But we consistently seem to run into this brick wall of actually using the stuff. And by use, I mean, um, I think that the world of business intelligence and the world of data visualization and, and, and reading experiments and things like that, exploratory kind of work, is, is a well-trod path, though there's always improvements happening. This whole other universe of using that data day-to-day -to, -day to send a good email, to provide a, the appropriate offer to a potential customer, to customize an experience in an e on a website or in an ad or whatever the case may be, has always kind of been the neglected part of the, of, of the work. And this is exactly what we were talking about during our during our prep call. I mean, we were talking about this sort of value activation chain, right? So, and maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. You know, where we where we go from this this everybody has tons and tons of data, right? But you know, going from data to BI, you know, that's got its own issues to then actually true activation. So, you know, tell me a little bit more. You, I, th I know you've been thinking about this idea, this value activation idea for quite quite some time. Tell me a little bit more about that. And, and you know, where, where are the pitfalls too? What have you seen? What are some of the ugly, ugly things that you've seen? The truth of most uh, analytic teams in my experience as a kind of a customer of them and a leader of them is that we have the work that is sort of the known work, the work that we kind of all signed on to do that we thought we were going to do when we took the job, you know, running experiments, uh, setting up our data, cleaning our data, whatever. And then there's all this other work that actually represents probably 75% of what we do, which is extracting lists, 
passing them around, getting them back, you know, like all this other junk that happens that is like this is like an endless line list of Jira tickets that you just at best you just try to make <laughs> so there's not too stale, you know. Oh, I, you know what? I've heard this from so <laughs> many people. You're <laughs> right. This endless, never ending list of of requests and and little little tidbit things that you've got to do, even yeah, though that's not I exactly don't... what you signed up for. Mm -hmm. Could you add a cut of this? Could I get a pull of that? You know, it's just death by a thousand paper cuts yep. or beta cuts, I guess. And um, anyway, uh, that that the thing that we need to account for is that that is actually a real part of the job. It's a real part of the value that analytics teams create, though it's not in the job description typically, though it's not the thing we're proud of, and though it's often not the thing that it's perceived to be the highest order work. The reason we're getting all these requests is they create a ton of value. It actually mm -hmm. really benefits your customer support team or your marketing team or your sales team or your finance mm -hmm. to get all these little custom cuts moved from wherever you're doing your BI over to wherever they work, whether that's a spreadsheet or or their email tool, or whatever the case may be. That is real and it's valuable. We got to pause on that because everybody complains about that, but you're absolutely right. The only reason all of this work exists is because somebody is trying to make a decision now and you know, for whatever reason, they can't find the report, or or the, or it's a new report. But you, the analyst or the data engineer is is pulling this report and and seeming putting together this data because there's there's value at the end. So you're right, actually, that that makes that should make a lot of people feel a lot better about what they're doing seventy five percent of the day. Yeah, it's funny, like this thing that is this, like it's this is the kind of the perception change. This thing that you feel like is the source of frustration and like not the 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 fulfilling part of your job, weirdly is actually, if you look at it a little bit differently, could be the most fulfilling, the most exciting part of your job because you're actually helping line of business people with urgent requirements, whatever those may be, yeah. to, to, to live up to their role and to propel your business forward. The problem is, is that it's very difficult. It's just really frustratingly challenging to manipulate that data, extract it, and get it where it needs to go. And that's kind of that that aspect of the job is the birth of this whole reverse ETL idea. Is like, how do we allow teams to live up to this really uh, potentially fulfilling and value additive thing that they do all day, but in a way that removes a lot of this drudgery and frustration and like the sense of, oh my goodness, another one of these? Didn't I provide you one of these four days ago? Um, and you did, 96% the same, but there's a 4% change that means you have to rewrite the query and do it again. Uh, and so, um, so anyway, that's where reverse detail comes in. It's like, okay, this is part of your value chain, whether you acknowledge it or not, instead of making it horrible, let's make it easy and fun for you and fun for them so that this, you can smoothly provide the business everything they need, uh, without all this stress and hassle. Um, so, so, so give me, give me an example, G you know, paint, paint the picture of, you know, there's a, there's a data engineer, um, you know, they are in this sort of, you know, ongoing request loop. You know, they 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 sign up with high touch. What what aspect is it improving, making more efficient, making their lives you know happier and easier? Sure. So I, I'd say that there's like two classic scenarios, um, but they're very very similar. So the first is um, we do this today. We do it with a ba like some sort of a, a batch pipeline that we built that runs, it, but it's kind of this like homebrew concoction. Yeah. That whatever alan wrote four years ago he's now on a different team or even a different company no one really understands it but it doesn't break very often so it's fine brian you have no idea like i had this <laughs> conversation with my biz ops you know leader yesterday where you know some ex-employee wrote a script a con job or something that you know like it's messy code or it's it's antiquated or it's still pulling data from salesforce we haven't used you know we we now moved on to hubspot right so mm -hmm. yeah totally i i get yeah. it and so every company just has this like ocean of tech debt here where somebody's tried to scale this, but because it's not their core role to build these pipelines and maintain them, their core role was something else. They get out of date, all the things you just said, so I won't repeat it. So anyway, oftentimes somebody will say like, okay, can I just essentially move this into a best, like a proper solution that just does this for a living? So we have really high throughput syncing. We have great change data capture. We have excellent observability. We can manage it by API or by Git sync or however we want to do it. And the answer is until the reverse detail was invented, no, you couldn't just hand this whole problem to somebody else and know that it was going to be a super bulletproof piece of infrastructure that would always work. And if it didn't, you would know why. Um, and so that's the classic one. The other bit of it that's a little more subtle, but interesting is when the requirement to do this is gated by effort. 
So somebody doesn't even want to take the time to make the cron job, or somebody doesn't want to take the time to generate the CSV to download and upload somewhere. The um, the usage of data is throttled. You don't end up with data in your HubSpot because nobody wants to write a script. You don't end up with data in your Zendesk because nobody wants to create the email list. You don't end up. And so the actual application of all the data that could occur is reduced to this very, very, very bare minimum. Yeah. And so when you have a tool like ours, um, uh, where the effort to move data is essentially zero. Like there is no incremental work required to move it to HubSpot and Facebook or HubSpot and Facebook and says it's the same. Suddenly the usage of data permeates the business in a new way. And the best part is it's good data. It's observed, clean, controlled data that the analytics team is blessed as like the good stuff, not this weird shadow data that's being concocted by little individual siloed, either operations people that know about a SQL or pocketed BI teams or this or that. It's the golden data is being populated in a controlled way everywhere all the time with no extra work. And so yeah, you get so a this... data-driven business as a result. So so this is this is really interesting because I mean you're 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 touching on a number of reasons why kind of BI goes off the rails, right? And you know, we we know that we know that companies have been interested in, you know, putting a data-driven culture in place for for years now. And they've invested in, you know, all sorts of different BI technologies over the over the past 20 years, 30 years. And yet the usage, the adoption of BI still struggles. So you know, one, I think you just mentioned it was, well, the data is not rich enough. I, I don't have the segmentation or I don't have the, the, you know, various data points, the richness to actually make an informed decision, right? So absolutely, I think that's one. And the other one was just this idea of, hey, it's broken. I don't trust it anymore. Or there's 15 reports that are 4% different from each other. Uh, which one is the actual one that, that makes sense? So, I mean, you're really talking about creating this, this single source of maintained truth that the data team now owns. So there's no shadow IT, there's, there's, there's just one single source of truth, right? So how do you guys think about that as sort of the, or what, is, what does single source of truth mean to you guys? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, candidly, I think we are actually the beneficiaries of, a, of an ongoing movement in our, in our industry to to try to consolidate and centralize a lot of this stuff. Um, and so what we see a lot is, I mean, look, I'll like, so if, one of the best ways to do this is do like a pre and post description. So the old days when I would work with my analytics teams, like we would have like literal, just like Google documents of like our data definitions. And yeah. we would shop them team to team to team and get like verbal agreement amongst us that if you're gonna pull A, B or C, this is how you're going to pull it, mm -hmm. therefore, if your data is 4% different from mine, to use your example, the first thing we're going to do is check the de definitional uh, list and see if we both did it the same. But it was all like human effort, right? Like it was all these handshake agreements and negotiations amongst teams. That's not a very scalable thought, like it's not a good way to run a business, right? Um, and so what we've seen is that as uh, companies realize that and they move towards software to do this and they tend to consolidate data into uh, one kind of cloud data warehouse environment, which in and of itself can actually be very, very complex with endless, you know, tables and things like that. But at least it's yep. all in one spot. Um, the the organizations, you know, we didn't talk that much about the idea of a data team ten years ago. You yeah, know? no, this is this is a this is a fairly new concept. Uh, yeah, exactly. But but it's it's kind of taken off because totally. I think the technology has gotten really good. The you know the snowflakes the red chips whatever, mm -hmm. um, an ecosystem has emerged around those technologies to help with all of this operational stuff, um, and then the like the team like you know the, the classic adage of people, process, and technology. It's kind of it's kind of having a moment here where these things are centralizing with people whose job it is, technology that's good and scalable, um, and then frankly we kind of just come in as a beneficiary of that where somebody who's done all that work to standardize their definitions, consolidate all their data into uh, at least one cloud provider, if not one table or anything. And they say, well, I have two mandates, mm -hmm. business intelligence and activation. Yep. I am doing pretty well on the business intelligence side because I work with BI tooling on all that. The activation, however, is still happening in spreadsheets and, and, and custom scripts. Let me also adopt tech to make that work well and scalably. And then the, the two horsemen of that, like suddenly the data team is really 
living up to its potential because they're solving all the BI requests. They're keeping their CFO in the know. They're supporting their business business stakeholders with consistent dashboarding and consistent data definitions. And in parallel, they're also feeding all these operational one-offs in a very uh, scalable way. Yeah, and 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 again, it's it's the same data no matter where the end consumption point is. And and I think I mean this this is where we're interested in things as well. And you know, I want to I want to back up a sec because you said that you know in your past experience you would have these these Google Google Docs where you had these definitions, right? You know, and everybody would agree on this is the definition, this is how you calculate it. So I mean. Maybe Brian, you were the the earliest adopter of a semantic layer, right? <laughs> um, you know, and, and and this is the space that we've been thinking about for the past five years, right? How do you make that consumption layer absolutely robust so that there's confidence by each of the teams, no matter who's consuming it? How do we make that really a confident consumption trusted experience? You know, no matter if you're using Power Metrics, our tool, or if you're using Tableau, or if you're using Excel sheets, right? So we want to we want to solve that issue there. So, you know, how how have you been thinking about you know with your customers as well and past experiences? How have you been thinking about metrics and making sure that that consumption layer is really nice and consistent? Well, you know, I I want to just be clear that like uh, like I said, I'm not like a I'm a business stakeholder who works with analytics teams. I'm not an analytics professional, so so bear with me as I I may use some of the wrong language and things. I'll do my best. Okay, I'll uh, I'll I'll point it out and and make fun of you if, if you do. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I think like uh, I would actually rely a lot on my experience in New Relic here. It was very important. We're dealing with a publicly traded company, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, of revenue and a lot of, like a a fiduciary responsibility we really held very deep to do what was right, you know? Mm-hmm. And we, we, of course, you can't derive every decision from data. Some decisions are going to be based on qualitative research or sometimes just like on conviction, you know, as a business. But when you can use data, you want to. And so what we would found a lot of times, though, was because we didn't really have this kind of semantic letter concept properly deployed, um, different analytical pockets of the business would explore a proposal and scenario model that proposal and have different results. Totally. And absolutely. You, you would try and peel apart why. And um, sometimes they were just methodological or assumptions we'd made. And that was okay, right? You can understand that. But then other times it was because we thought like we were computing the same metric, but they weren't the same metric. Secretly, they were, they were quite different. Um, the table we were referencing was slightly out of sync or the the time bounding we were using was out of sync or whatever and we would burn analyst weeks figuring that out because the decisions we were making were multi hundred million dollar decisions mm-hmm. uh like like we would every 90 days with public company we have to report to the street right so if we did this wrong we were going to be held to account 89 days later it's a very yep. scary thing, right so it was worth it to burn months of analyst time to figure this out and so what we found ourselves doing a lot was after this had all occurred and we we figured out all the deviations and we've solutioned it and we've now informed what was hopefully a good decision, we're left with this question like, how do we institutionalize this? How do we not do this the next time? Mm-hmm. I don't think, and this is where my depth of knowledge, like the data engineering team might be a good candidate for you to interview for one of these. They probably know and have improved in the year plus since I left. But like because we didn't have like any technology governing this, a lot of it in a way became like a fancier version of my Google Sheet. Yeah, like, totally. uh, we 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 would rely a lot on collaboration software and peer peer review and stuff like that to to solve this, not uh, necessarily ingrained definitions. Now, as I was leaving, what we had started to do was to actually move to a shiny new clean data warehouse instance, where we were going to ingrain a lot of these things definitionally there and like like I think they were called like the golden zone or whatever. Like yeah. this is the zone of, of of blessed metrics that you are permitted to do these kinds of analyses off of. Um, and if you need a new blessed metric, we have a collaboration process to create one, to put it in the zone so that this doesn't happen going forward. Um, so it's interesting. A lot of it is not tech, right? A lot of it is 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 collaboration and behavior. Absolutely. It's that intersection between, you know, the, the business user who who very well understands the the metric, you know, and the nuances of that metric, right? And the data team that understands the quality and the nuances of how, you know, the data is assembled and joined and and the time, you know, variations across time zones kind of affect things, right? So it really is this this social contract 
between the the data side and the business side and and I think this is what's this is what is really interesting to us right I think right now as you said a lot of this this description and metric definition is happening almost at the data warehouse layer that that really has grown like crazy and and the the rigor and the the the, the players in that space have have made huge strides um, but we still have this idea of well I've now made this dashboard and and you've made a dashboard and they're slightly different right so I think what you're what you're saying is absolutely right and it's still needed and and this is why it's it's an emerging field for us to really understand well what is that social contract all the way through right through don't just stop at the data warehouse go all the way through right through to the report and and the business intelligence tools that you're using so mm-hmm. that's that's clearly what we're thinking about so with with high touch, what it means is that the data is richer, and the users are using more of that, and they they put more value into that data. So all of a sudden, this whole equation is more important. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and uh, and I don't know. Speaking as somebody, because I used to always I had this funny situation where I was wearing the hat of the guy leading the marketing group, spending the money, using data to make decisions. I was also wearing the hat of the person leading the analytics group who was equipping that team with this sure. information. And so, depending on which hat I was wearing, would often dictate how stressed out I was, because the as as a business person, I was like, let's get this done. Let's move. Let's move. We have to make money. But the analytical side of me is like, is that data good enough to permit me to do that? What's my risk tolerance here? And like, should Brian of analytics be telling Brian of marketing, slow down? <laughs> this is wrong. This is dangerous. That data might not be good enough, etc. And so this constant tension, being able to resolve that tension, where you just kind of know if it's good enough. It's in the system, it's available. If it's not there, it's not there for a reason, but we can work together to prepare it and put it there, um, is I think one of the the big opportunities as as the, the, the semantic layer gets more broadly adopted and as just in general, this collaboration and partnership between business execution teams and analytics teams kind of deepens and broadens, um, is to, to remove that like little devil angel kind of dynamic of I need to act, but I I there's a decent probability that the data I'm acting upon will result in something bad, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that, that will give anybody a reason for pause, right? So, but it's, mm-hmm. but it's not just, it's not just human consumption, right? It's, it's also like machine consumption. And, and again, like the, the more defined, the more rich, you know, the data is, the more of a history we have, like, you know, if, if this data definition has been consistent for five years, all of a sudden, machines and, and and AI can do a lot, lot more with it. Um, what's 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 your take? I mean, everybody's talking about this stuff right now. What's your take on sort of the richness of data and and using AI uh, to 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 further you know generate insights and, and guidance for business? Sure. I mean, I think uh, I have uh, my particular lens is coming from this place of activation. So I'll yeah. kind of speak with from there, which is yeah, a lot of. The customers we we speak with, the businesses we work with, or even things I'm trying to do, um, are very much that. My aspiration is machine to machine that appears to a human not to have been that. That requires um, an enormous amount of computation and dynamic kind of personalization, and so there's a huge amount of variability here. Um, like this uh, very difficult vision of. The experience is just for you and could not possibly be delivered in this way to anybody else mm-hmm. in the world. But you can't tell that it was completely algorithmically created. Mm-hmm. is is a is an interesting thing to aspire to, and um, many of our customers are chasing that dream now. But and, but, but certainly yeah. with 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 the ability to for high touch to bring in more context about each individual record, this must be this must be you know glucose for for an AI machine. Yeah, it, it really is. Yeah, it's exactly right. So like we see um, companies that are really leaning in here. So I don't I don't want to name the company, but we were talking to somebody the other day and like in their like customer record table, any single individual customer profile will have, I think they told us like upwards of 1500 predictive analytics traits on that customer record. Wow. Um, and they have to decide of those 1500, what do they want to expose to a marketer to actually use? in any given email campaign or in application customization or something mm-hmm. that they want to do. So this is really interesting thing. This is not science fiction anymore. This is a big Fortune 500 company. They are actively predicting thousands of attributes of everyone they encounter. And then they want to, and what they're talking to us is, I want to give that to my business teams to do stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and so it's it's happening. 
And the question is, well, are those predictions accurate and good? And then for the marketer, you can't actually hand, even a marketer who is a customer thinking at scale, you can't actually hand them 1,500 potential personalization opportunities. Like that's, it'll just break your brain, right? Yeah. So you need to figure out ways to slim this down to what is high value in terms of the customer's experience and like somewhat intelligible and manageable by the, the marketing organization that's deploying this. Uh, and I think that's kind of the next frontier. I don't think it's actually a solved art. Like we can solve, of course, the the UI to pick the attributes you're going to use and to control it and all that stuff. But I really do think we're just scratching the surface of what's going to be possible here because rewind two years, those 1500 traits didn't exist. You know, like we are, we're just figuring out how to generate them. And then the next thing is what do you do with them and how? So, so let's, let's follow that thought a little bit, right? Because, you know, I'm, I think that the, the, the future of traditional monolithic BI tools is, is probably something a little bit of the past, right? And I think what you're describing is a little bit more, you know, operationally just in time ready, um, you know, and, and even all of these, you know, 1500 attributes and priorities, you know, is the, is the future of BI not really an analytics tool? Is it more of a just in time, real time, you know, decision making support? You know, how, how, how do you guys, how do you, how do you envision that for your customers? Well, I think um, for like the, the, for the concept of activation, I actually do think very much so. Yes. Like just in time is actually very compelling because um, interactions are happening at like, at, at just a, like, it's, it's, it's not what's, what's more than one to many. It's like one to many, 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 many. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you're an enterprise with like, I don't know, you're a supermarket and you've got a grocery app, right. There's potentially at any given moment, tens of thousands of people interacting mm -hmm. with that application to figure out their groceries for that week. And you, you could have these like standardized audiences where you bucket people like people who previously bought popcorn, people who previously bought lettuce, people who previously bought whatever. But I, I think the world we're moving towards is, is a machine that's more intelligent than that, uh, that doesn't just look at your past, but kind of predicts your future. And then that application is different for all of us. Many big companies like Netflix famously and mm -hmm. other you know, really big, highly technical organizations do versions of this already. Um, but it's, it is Netflix and like three other companies. Right, right, now, exactly. But the rest of us, you know, like one of the cool things about technology is it tends to move from like this very elite resource rich group that innovates and over time it tends to move out because we figure out how to scale things, we figure out how to do things. And I think kind of the AI moment is sure, Walmart could do this five years ago, but no one else could. What if you or I could with the e-commerce store that we started? You know, uh, I think that's some of the opportunity that's coming. Yeah, and absolutely. I mean, you think of all of those things, right? I mean, big data used to be the thing. Now everybody has big data. You know, AI used to be this elusive thing, and now everybody's toying and testing with it, right? So 100%. I mean, I think there's a huge opportunity. I mean, for us, you know, the, the flip side is, oh my God, all this data and all this extra noise is going to create this complete wild west. So again, we need to make sure that everybody knows what metrics matter and, and how they're defined. Um, so Yes, everybody has access, but let's make sure that it's it's not overwhelming. Uh, and that, that's actually an interesting idea, right? That you know people are not using or not engaging with data because it's just too much. So I think it's up to us and companies like you know High Touch and Clifolia to make sure that that value actually gets through, you know, and helps a user, you know, manage and, and make decisions from their data. So, so Brian, listen, sort of closing closing thoughts, right? Um, you know, let's let's touch a little bit more about on this sort of this this path to activation, right? And you know, how do we how do we move beyond pure analytics, you know, and really sort of influence business outcomes? And I mean, I know this is exactly what you guys are trying to do and, and help your customers and, and and having awesome success with it. But tell me tell me the story. I mean, what's your advice, you know, for somebody who really wants to move beyond just you know using the data to make uh, rudimentary everyday decisions? To kind of supercharging that, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think and I, I've been privileged to see and actually participate in this for the, the actual career development of a, of a number of analysts and, and people I've worked with. I kind of uh, it's maybe it's not like it's a term I use. I don't know if it's a real term or not. This idea of like a career career advancing move that people can do, and I think about it as like um, though as I mentioned, a portion of the value and a portion of the job as a as a as an analytics professional or data professional is related to business intelligence and creating wisdom for the company, like what's going on, how much money are we making, et cetera. 
Um, what I've noticed is that in some ways doing that well is a little bit table stakes. It's like, mm -hmm. of course, you're supposed to make a good dashboard and read it out effectively. That's the job. That's why we hired you. Um, I think that what I've noticed is analysts that sort of separate and whose careers just kind of take off are the ones who really look to equip the business to do stuff. And that's where I get really excited about that that other aspect of the job that we kind of turn our nose up to, but actually is very exciting. Like I, I can literally, I can speak to, I won't name them out of respect for their privacy, but like actual analysts who became, went from junior analysts to directors in like record time because they perceive themselves to be, I'm in the job of enabling the business. I'm not in the job of creating data. And so if to enable the business, I need to get data into HubSpot so the email team can do something. And today they're blocked because they got 75 email ticket requested and we can have most service two a week. I'm going to fix that. I'm going to make it so that before they they ask, the data's there. They ask, the data's there. Or more on the pure analytics side, like I know that they just asked for a dashboard, but I'm going to figure out and actually scenario model five different ways that this plays out and rank them by likelihood to occur. And I'm going to read that out, not just the dashboard. You know, it's the career advancing move is to get into the business, get into the thick of it and help the CEO, help the CFO, help the director of marketing, help the director of success actually do stuff. And uh, I just think I can, again, I could rattle off five, 10 names right now of analysts who have done that. And and all of them are better for it. And the businesses are better for it too. It's a, kind of like those, no one loses. So why don't we all do this kind of things, you know? Brian, I, I totally love it. I, I love this idea of like, you know, get into the thick of the business. Like, so advance your career because you're actually helping the business grow, right? I think I think that's fantastic. Everybody, Brian Cutler, VP of Marketing at High Touch. Brian, again, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, it's mine too. Thank you so much for having me. If you enjoyed today's conversation about metrics and data, be sure to check out Metric HQ, our online resource for the metrics that matter most to you and your business.